Welcome, I'm excited. I am super pumped. With me is heavyweight UFC champion, Boss Rutten. Boss, welcome. I'm doing great. How are you doing, Bert? I, I'm, it's good to see you. It's good to, you know, always fun to catch up with you. And, and I'm excited about what's happening uh, with all the stuff that you're doing. So here you are, your um, UFC champion, Pancras champion. Yep. yep undefeated. Times. Undefeated. Three times. Yep. Uh, inventor. Yeah. Business per businessman. Yeah. Movie check. star. Ch ch well, I'm starting on that now. <laughs> TV star is going to be. I'm going to work on a new next, TV right? show. Yeah. But you've been in you've been in a few movies. I've Four been, or five, six movies. Yeah, but you know, you always I, I always say that uh, once people say, oh, you know, you're an actor. That means that you can provide your family from acting, and that I couldn't do. Right. But now hitting into the new TV show, yeah. Now, yeah. now I'm an actor yeah. because now I'm literally making money in order to support my family. I can call myself a professional <laughs> actor. I love it. I love it. Look, congratulations! I'm Thank excited you. about that. And that's on the show with Kevin James. Uh, the show is called Kevin Can Wait. Kevin Can Wait on yep. CBS. On yep. CBS. Yeah, and it's a funny show. I've been watching it since last time you and I spoke. I had seen the commercials, but I hadn't watched it. So I went back on the CBS app, little plug for CBS app, and watched it. It's, it's pretty funny stuff. It's funny stuff. Yeah, it's the number one sitcom right now. Oh, so, I believe it. Yeah. I believe it. So, and, and, and it's different from when he was uh, King of Queens. Yeah. A, a lot of, some of the similarities, but again, different environment, because this one, he's, it's a family. He's got, uh, what, two, three kids? He's got three kids, uh, two girls and a boy, and then you're the... How, what's your role in this? I'm the neighbor, Rutger, the, the kind of weird neighbor. He's from Holland. So, uh, you know, I, I, I say these sayings go, what is it, go big or go home? Right. You know, instead of go, go home or go big. No, what is it? Go home or go big? No, go, go big or go home. Go so I say go home or go big. You know, right. I, I reverse <laughs> all these things. And the crazy thing is, when I came to America, uh, I had an interview, a, a bunch of interviews in the beginning when I was here, and they all, always asked me what I wanted to do. I said, well, my... My goal is to be in TV. I would like, oh, so you prefer TV over movies? I, say, I think I do, because I think TV is a better medium, you know, it connects with more people. Right. And he says, so what kind of movie? I said, uh, what kind of TV show? I said, my wish will be to be on an American sitcom. Oh, my goodness. That's always my biggest wish, comedy, sitcom, half an hour, each week, and boom. I got it. You hurt. got it. <laughs> and I'm, you got I'm it. And I'm <laughs> so <laughs> stoked. Yeah, it's really cool. Oh man, I'm excited. So yeah, I'm excited to watch you on that. And uh, and maybe uh, down the road, maybe you can sneak me on set. Oh, that's always easy because it's uh, you know they, they shoot it in front of a live audience right. on Fridays. So we're rehearsing during the week, and then on Friday, you know that's that it's go time. And, and you know I got to tell you, it's that was a little scary in the beginning. You know, in front of a camera. You know, you mess up, you make yeah. a new take, nobody noticed. But, you know, you're doing it in front live of live audience. audience. That's the same as fighting. Yeah. You know, that's what I always tell people. You know, the, the, well, you have these guys in the gym, you know, that I sometimes I send to other gyms because they're so good. And you go, okay, well, this guy's going to be a world champion because he's beating up the champions at this moment. Right. But, you know, there's some guys who are really good, but they can't do it under pressure. Mm. You know, so I always tell people that, that being a good in a gym doesn't mean anything. What, once you start fighting and you, you're good in, in competing under pressure, uh, you're actually winning, that's when you can say, okay, now I'm a professional fighter. But to make that transition, little transition it's, it's a hard transition. But, you know, some get it. Yeah. Uh, you don't in the beginning. The beginning, it's chaos. I always had that. My first fights, I don't even remember, <laughs> you know. But, uh, you know, slowly but surely, then you get it. It becomes more normal. You know, right. the more you do it, it's like anything else in life, I guess. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. There's so many things I want to talk to you about. So I'm just going to, we're going <coughs> to, we're here at his gym, by the way. Um, and, and so we're just going to free flow with this interview because I, I'm, I'm just so pumped to be here. First of all, let's start with your logo. Here we are. This is a great logo. So yeah. who came up with this? You know, it's really weird. What happened was, uh, after my, I used to do this for fun. Right. You know, as a kid, I would always jump in the splits in the air to show off, I guess. Sure. And uh, when I had my first fight in Japan, I was so excited because, first of all, there were no weigh-ins, which I thought was weird. Yeah. And then on the day of the fight, I realized there is no, there is no weigh-ins because there is, it's an open weight class. Because I looked at my opponent, and he's like a tall Japanese guy, like 6'3", 245 pounds, and I go, I'm fighting him? Yeah, I, isn't, isn't he heavier? Because, yeah, he's 245, and I was 200 pounds. So I go, okay, so he says, no, there's no weight classes. I go, great, awesome, I love it, I love it, you know, but I was bluffing, of course. Right, right, right. I said, so how many rounds we're fighting? One round. I say, awesome, how many minutes? 30. I go, great. <laughs> you know? 
But I wasn't inside. I wasn't thinking. Great. I go look at my manager. I go, dude, what did you get me into here? So I knocked the guy out in 43 seconds. Wow. Yeah. And I was so euphoric. I guess I jumped in the splits to every corner. Corner. And it became the root and jump. From that moment on, they loved it so much. The newspapers had the splits. You know, the next day people started bowing to me on the street. It was the wildest experience. But now it became the root and jump, and I had to do it after every victory. That's so. awesome. Now. I'm trying to remember this this fight where you where you fight the tall Japanese gentleman. Um, what color were your trunks? Purple, pink, purple, purplish pink. Pink, yeah, because that was kind of different too. I, they, I, I saw this. I'm going. Yeah, what am I looking at here? Is is, is the film off? Because yeah. this guy is wearing these and they were pumpkins. ripped up. Yeah, yeah. It wore my, those were my lucky shorts. Yeah, yeah. I was in the. Um, in the beginning, you know, you're superstitious a little bit. You sure. know, and now I always say, when they ask me, are you superstitious? I say, no, it's bad luck to be superstitious. <laughs> <laughs> and you get it right yeah. away, but there's a lot of people when I say that, it flies right over yeah. their head. And as one person starts laughing, you go, whoa, 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 wait, that's a contradiction. I go, ah, yeah. he's got it. So, no, I steered away from that. But it, there were, those were my lucky shots in Thai boxing. And I figured, you know, if I have something that I won with in, in Thai boxing, let's bring that pair of shorts to Japan. I did two shows with them, and then they asked me, they actually gave me a new set. <laughs> you know, because they're very expensive, like $1,200 a new set. Really? Yeah, those are very specially made, and they made a really nice red set for me, and they said, could you please wear this? <laughs> please put on some manly pants here. <laughs> that was their way of saying, we don't like what you're wearing. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know what, and it's interesting, I want to talk about this, quote, superstition. In, in psychology, they call that anchoring, right? Yep. And so um, in my book, Dominating Your Mind, which is coming out soon, I talk about anchoring. And so you can call it superstition. You could call it a good luck charm. But you put on these pants or you do uh, a certain routine that gets you mentally psyched up, right? You get into that. It helps you feel better. helps you feel stronger. So you can call it whatever you want, but we all do little rituals like that. Yep. You know, uh, maybe right before you go on live, you know, maybe you do something, maybe you say a quick prayer, maybe, you know, whatever. But just about every athlete that I know, every, every person that I know that goes in front of a live audience, like a speaker, they have some kind of routine uh -huh. to get them, you know, psyched up. And, and it's important. It's a, very important. And, and once you have a routine and it works, and I, I always tell people, I do a stretch routine and I do it uh, still the same stretch routine as I did 25 years ago. Wow. And they go like, why, why do you never change? I said, because I never had an injury. So why would why I change? change? Yeah. You know, if something is good, I don't change it. And maybe that's the kind of superstitious I am. Not really superstitious, but it's a winning combination. Oh, I was wearing these shorts. Okay, let's keep it all the same. Right. You know, you also have a team. You see this happen happening many times with fighters. They, for instance, they, they build themselves up. They're 10 years with a coach. They brought them to the limelight. And suddenly they go to the UFC. They start making the bigger money. And then they don't want to pay the 10% from the, that they have to pay the coach. Right. Who was with them for 10 years. Right. And I go... That's pretty pathetic, but what happens then, they fire that guy. And at that, at that moment, you break the magic spell. Yeah. And because that winning team that you have, everything is included. And you see all these guys, all of them. I haven't met an example yet. All went downhill from there on. Yes. You know, next fight, an injury happened. Or next fight, he loses. And you know, it always happens. If you have a winning combination, never break that winning combination. That's yeah. my, my, my saying. Yeah, no, absolutely. I agree with you. You know, a really good example of that uh, <coughs> Look what happened to um, Tiger Woods when he got surrounded by all that junk. I mean, it was his fault, but yep. when it destroyed his career because his, his mind was never the same. He couldn't, you know, he's not, he might someday overcome it, but as of yet, he, I don't think he's been able to mentally get there. Yep. And until you can get there mentally, you can't get there physically. And you, you see, and this, this is what I always tell people, you know, but in the beginning they would say, oh, you know, Mixed martial arts is like 50% 50, 50 mental, it's like 50% uh, technique. And I say, it's not, it's a 100% it's mental. In order for me to get out of bed in the morning to train, I have to make the decision here. Everything yeah. is made up here, you know, everything. So once you disturb that and you take it off, you see it with baseball uh, players. I have a friend of mine who is a really good uh, sports psychologist, and he's been doing this for years. I know him 15, 20 years now. And uh, he gets guys, and of course we don't get names because it's very private, but they suddenly start missing balls. Right. And they have ways to reconnect all these little what have, eons, whatever it is, and, and to reprogram these guys so they start hitting balls again. But it can be a little tiny thing 
that can mess everything up. And that's what with Tiger Woods, we were talking about John Jones. He's going to make, come back now fighting the, the, the Daniel Cormier. Right. And, um, you know, so much happened in his life. And then now lately his mother passed away on top of it. He got caught with cocaine, he got drunk driving, he smashed his car, he got run away from the police, then he hit a woman and he ran away. And I mean, there was so much stuff that he did. I wonder how he's gonna come back, you yeah. see? Now he's young and he's mentally very strong, so I don't see it as a problem, but it could affect him. Sure, okay. I, and, and that's gonna be the test. You know, it, it's so important. And I like what you said there. It's all up here. Yep. You know, and it doesn't matter what you do for a living. It doesn't have to be a sport. I mean, but it, it all happens up here. Uh, you know, you look at a great writer, uh, you know, Stephen King, for, in, for example, who's written tons of books. You know, he mentally prepares every day. And, and part of his routine is to write 1,500 words minimum every day, whether he feels likes it or not. Yep. I mean, that's part of the discipline that he does. But it is all up here. And what's interesting is the older I get, the more I realize how important this is. I mean, you have to see it, you have to be able to believe it here before you can make it out there. And it's also funny how things change. Like yesterday, I have Rama, he's a fighter for the Professional Fighters League where I uh, uh, commentate for on NBC. Right. And, um, and he was here visiting, and so we went out to dinner. And you know, you see this, I, I, he was the same as I was when I was young. That's why I think I really connect to him. You know, wild guy, you know, having fun. And I told him yesterday, I said, you know, because he was telling these stories and I said, there's really something weird that's gonna happen to you. I said, once you get my age and you think back about what you're saying right now, you're gonna go like, ooh, I was kind of another guy. And, and I said, that's the moment that you can see yourself as the people see you right now. Right. Everybody, you don't see it, but in 25 years from now, you're gonna go, oh, wow, yeah, now I realize what these people saw. I was kind of a crazy guy, you know? <laughs> it's weird when you grow up, you start thinking more calculated. For me, it was perfect. I started MMA at 28, mm. which is a very late age. Yeah, it is. I already competed in Thai boxing, so I was used to doing something in front of an audience, but still to learn a whole new craft, it's a hard thing to do. But I think my age with me helped me. You know, I, when I was 28, I was still 20. You know, I was always this kid. I'm still right. a kid. I'm still crazy. I still do crazy things. Actually, when people see me, they say, oh my God, you, he's, I, he moves so much. He talks so much. When friends of mine from Holland come over, they were like, oh man, you're so relaxed now. This is crazy. <laughs> they call this relaxed. So you can only imagine how I was. I was completely nuts. <laughs> oh my and I goodness. can't turn it off. I can't turn it off at home. I don't know what it is, but I, I'm happy it ha happened that I started right thinking and that happens at a later age my, my biggest power I always say 33 years of age I think that's where I was the most mature most powerful most everything everybody always thinks it's around 20 25 it's not you're the strongest around 33 34 yeah yeah and matter of fact I, I, I would agree with you I think I had some of my uh, what do you call it uh, my biggest growth during my 30s during my 40s not so much now that I'm 50 not so much uh, but you're right, between 30 and 40, I had all my big, big growth, all, that, my, all yeah. my big stuff. Um, all right, so let's talk about this. Here you are, you were, you were a Thai, uh, Thai, boxer, yep. Thai boxer, thank you. And what, what attracted you to UFC? Um, it, it was kind of weird. I, we didn't know anything about the UFC yet. So, so what happened was this. I lost a fight. I should have never taken a fight. I fought a few fights that I shouldn't have taken after three years of not competing, right. being drunk, and <laughs> saying yes to a certain fighter who was in jail, training for a comeback, was like 49-0 and 0 with 46 knockouts. Oh, my goodness. His nickname was The, the Animal, Frank oh The Animal Lutman. And, uh, and, and two months later, in February, they gave me a call. And, and the, the person on the phone tells me, hey, why do we send the posters to? And I said, what posters? He says, from the fight. I said, who's fighting? You. I said, what? <laughs> Who am I fighting? He said, Frank Lohmann. I say, when did, did we talk about that? He goes, December. You remember? I was at the, the club. I was a bouncer. And I, he was there. And he asked me if I, and I remember him. I go, oh, man, yeah. I did say that. <laughs> I said, when is the fight? In two and a half weeks. <laughs> so I didn't prepare anything. I was a bouncer who worked from 10 in the, uh, in the evening to like five or six in the morning a.m. Oh, and morning. then many times we would go to after parties with the whole group of bouncers. Sure. So it's not the most healthiest lifestyle. And uh, needless to say, I lost that fight. And, and I got spit out by the Dutch audience. It was amazing that one loss, I knocked everybody out before I fought, who I fought, everybody. And uh, suddenly I was a bad fighter. So I, I, I kind of vowed not to fight for Holland anymore. So I started doing these 
crazy because martial arts was still in me. I wanted to do something. I started making the, with a buddy of mine, he was my teacher in Taekwondo. He's a very talented guy. We started doing these martial arts shows. For instance, we would go to the nightclub. We say that we want to do a show there. At midnight, the music goes down. And then suddenly, the, when the light turns up, we're standing there in our spandex, whatever you're wearing, pumped up. And then we had these choreographed fight scenes and with sticks and with nunchucks and with short sticks and long sticks. And we do wow. break tests. We brought concrete and we did all our music. And then we started incorporating comedy into it. And that was a, we hit the bullseye with that. Suddenly, we start getting invited for TV and we went to Europe. We start traveling through Europe, European TV. And so, so people start knowing us. And we would come up, for instance, if I had to walk to the ring, if it was in an uh, at event, at a Thai boxing event, and in the break, we would do a show. Right. We would go a backflip, pop, 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 wow. pop, 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 super salt, and then we walk to the ring. So at one of these shows, a guy, Chris Dolman, was there. And he was uh, the, the head of Holland from the organization Rings in Japan. It was, it was a mixed martial arts organization. And he said, man, I remember you from Thai boxing. You're an animal, and, and now I see you doing all these crazy backflips and stuff like that. He said, are, are you interested in free fighting in Japan? I said, what's free fighting? And so he started explaining me the rules, and I told him, I said, and they pay you for it, right? And I go, yeah. I go, yes, sign me up. So I started training, got my butt handed to me the first time, like really bad. I had to stop my car next to the road, called my wife on my old cell phone, you remember the beginning cell phones? <laughs> and uh, I said, listen, I, they crushed me. I gotta, I'm going to take a few hour nap, and then I'm, I'm going to come home. And I came home the next day, she goes, she's laughing. She goes, so that's uh, so much for your free fighting, right? <laughs> I said, no, 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 I'll be back. In, and within six months, I'm going to tap the, hill, the whole gym there. You watch, because I'm going to learn this game. You know, as injury here, injury there. It wasn't working out. And suddenly, I got a phone call from him. And he said, hey, you got to come to the gym right now. We have these uh, two guys, Funaki and Suzuki. They're the owners from a new organization called Pancras in Japan. And they're looking for new talent. And they want to see you move and spar. So I went to Amsterdam and I got into a scuffle with one of the rings champions because mm. they, and the guy went really hard. And I told him after the first round, I said, dude, we don't have to go hard. They just want to show technique, you know, kicks, but just relax. So he went harder. I think he, was, I, he thought I was afraid. <laughs> so then the second round, I go to him, I say, hey, it's okay. I'm going to do it back now, just so you know. And I knocked him out instantly, pretty much, with a high kick to the head, which looked very spectacular. And he had a whole bunch of stitches he needed. He was bleeding. So I saw the Japanese people point at me. And that was it. I was in. And I think two months later, I was suddenly in Japan. So it came as a total surprise. Never expected to make money with fighting. Wow. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. incredible. You know, and, and again, what, here's one of the takeaways <coughs> that I, from this story that, that uh, that I'm hearing is, first of all, I mean, first of all, you got good at, at, the, at this entertainment portion. Somebody saw you, says, hey, try this UFC stuff. Somebody there from uh, saw you, uh, and then now you're doing this pancreas stuff. You, you were good, and, and that good led to something else, which leads to something else, which leads to something else. Yep. And, and just like now in acting, you, you know, you started as a trainer with Kevin James, and that relationship led to something Started else, and led to yep. something else. And, and so sometimes people are looking for the shortcut, and the shortcut is you have to be good at something. You have to, you know, there's, you have to put in the time, you have to do the work, you have to be good at one thing, that way people get to know you. It's, uh, you know, the, the example I use is, um, I started competing in Pancras, and I won my first two fights by knockout, lost the third by submission because I didn't know submissions. Fourth fight won again, and I lost again by submission, and I won again, and I lost. And then I made my, had my last loss against Ken Shamrock. And that was the moment, the defining moment for me that I realized, okay, if I don't learn this, the ground game, I'm never going to be something in this. So why not, while I'm training anyway, go all the way? You know, you got to shoot for the stars, I always say. Let's go all the way, see if I can become a world champion. And I got obsessed suddenly with, with submissions. It, it, became, it became so crazy. I mean, I wake my wife up in the middle of the night, <laughs> would dream a submission, put her in the submission, ask her where it hurts. It's your shoulder, right? Yeah, shoulder down. <laughs> the next day, I would try out the submission in class. And this happened a bunch of times. Whoa. This is not like a one-time deal. My poor wife, she would walk <laughs> through the house. I say, honey, lean over. And I would get her in a guillotine choke. I say, you feel pain on your throat now, or you feel lightheaded? She goes, lightheaded. I say, good, that's a blood choke. If I do this, it hurts, right? Yeah, okay. Okay, good, I got it. And then I would, you know, so my poor wife went through the whole thing, the whole house was little post-its, and, and you know, I got so crazy 
but I never lost a fight again. Wow. I won my next eight fights by submission. One with submission control, but to a decision, but seven by decision, uh, submission. So now these guys, everybody was like, what, what's going on here? And that was it. I, my last 22 fights I never lost. You see, so it, it, you know, it's just what you want to do. Yeah. You want to be good, well, you're going to have to learn it. And I hate these people who always stay in their comfort zone. Yeah. I say, go out of your comfort zone. What is my out of my comfort zone? It's me on my back and an opponent on me. Okay, so that's how I'm going to start every single day now, two, three times a day. I lay on my back. I don't take any position. I reverse them, go for a submission. Boop. Okay, back on my back. Jump on top again. I put myself in the worst possible uh, position and I escape. And because I did that, I, I'm just mastering in, in escaping. You know, a cool thing was I, I got inducted into the UFC Hall of Fame in, uh, two years ago, in 2015. Oh, excellent. Congratulations. And they, uh, thank you. Thank you. That was really cool. And, and they had the statistics. And it was a really cool statistic. If one jumped out for me, it said that I won 14 times by submission, yet I never attempted a single takedown. So that meant that my opponent would take me down <laughs> and then I would submit them. <laughs> you know? So that was a cool thing. And also I went in cool. as a striker. I know, I know, 13 submissions and 12 uh, knockouts. So I actually, in the end of my career, I had more submission victories than I had knockouts. I was primarily a striker going in. But I really started love, to love the ground game. It's something I still miss till this day because I can't train because of my knees and my neck and the surgeries I had. You know, I can work out, but I can't roll on the ground anymore. Right. And every time when I see people do it, I go, oh, I would love to do that. Because that's a, a, it's a game that continually, continuously evolves. Right. You know, every workout you're going to go, oh man, this is crazy, I never knew, okay, I, I can use this, oh, but I can apply it to this move and this move and this move, you know, everything becomes better. And it's cool because you're working your brain, you know, you're exploring. It's a really cool sport. You know, watching you, I mean, first of all, I love your passion there. And it, it's, it sounds to me like this ground game is almost like a chess game, right? Because you've got to outsmart your, your, your opponent, right? Yep. And you've got to figure out how to position and all that other stuff. I like that. You know, and, and you hit a key word that sometimes people use this, this word in a negative, and, and that's the word obsession. Yep. I think that if you're going to get good, you have to be obsessed. You have to. And I love the fact that your wife, bless her heart, oh. was helping you. I mean, because a lot of people are going to say, well, both of you guys are crazy. I mean, you're crazy, but your wife to help you is crazy too. But that's what it takes. That, that, that's a husband and wife team that makes a difference. Well, we, we can say it like this. The, the, the biggest documentary ever on HBO shown was The Smashing Machine with Mark Kerr, who was this fighter that I trained, and he became this rock star in Japan. And he had a bad relationship with his wife. Mm. You know, and all day long on the phone, on the, I mean, he could talk two hours on the phone, and you saw, and I'm, I'm constantly telling him, I say, you got to step away from me. You're doing too much. And she was in his head the whole time, and calling him a nobody, blah, blah, blah. And slowly but surely, you know, he started taking painkillers, new bane, and he starts showing it, shooting up new bane on camera, you know. So oh. that's why it became such a big document. But you saw this guy who was on top of the world, slowly but surely, career is gone. And I guarantee you, because of her. Sure. Because, and I remember she, he made a comeback and she was there again, which I couldn't believe because he lost so many times now and I, I thought she would have left him already, but they had a kid together, so, you know, still they're together. together. But it was unfortunate because, you know, he lost at that event and she comes running into the dressing room and gets in his face, are you stupid at this? And I literally put her out of the room. I said, are you serious? You can't wait two days? You look at him. He's down right now. This is the guy who's on top of the world. He's sitting like this. He's almost crying. Right. And you stomp it in a little bit more. Give him a little bit of compassion here. Give him two days. And then do it. Right. You know, let him get used to it. But that's what I always... My wife was always behind me. And, uh, and thankfully. And she had many times a reason to, to leave me. Because, you know, if you fight big, you know, it's party time, big time, you know. Right. And I was gone for three days. Well, you know. I was just crazy, but she always said to me, um, I knew that eventually you would come back, she said. I was just waiting for that moment. <laughs> bless, yeah. her, bless her heart. But you know, it's so important, uh, these relationships. I could see, you know, if your wife is not helping you, if she's not on your team, if she's the one coming after you, yeah, that's going to take a lot. Because if, if I come after you, you know, it's different. It's, you know, it, it's a, a stranger or maybe if, if you and I are, are, are close friends and I come after you, you have a defense for that. But your wife is in your inner circle. Yep. And when she is not supporting you, when she's telling you you're a loser, you're stupid, you're never going to amount to anything, 
Dude, and man, that is crushing. That it is won't crushing. work, and, and, and it's hard for them as well. You know, my last fights, once I have all the injuries, and it's for the whole family, you know, I will literally move to a different house. Yeah. Because I would, I would not be the nicest guy. I had full with injuries. I'm getting rehab the whole day. You know, I'm training, go to rehab. Training, go to rehab, you know, and there's a lot of pain. You're not happy. You know, that's, that's what stopped my career. I, mm. I wasn't looking forward to training anymore. And to come back over that comfort zone and obsession, what you said, you know, just look at yourself as a kid. When you're in school, all the all the, the the subjects where you excel at are all subjects you love. Yes, the absolutely. The ones that you don't like, that's the ones. Those are the ones you suck. So that should be right away to you explaining to you. Okay, I gotta sh find something that I love to do. Yeah. You know, and thankfully for me, that submission game suddenly I never liked it because they beat me with it. But then suddenly, when I felt the nick and what I could do, man, it it, uh, it just changed me everywhere. Yeah. Everything. Absolutely. I love that. I love that. What a great story. And what's so interesting, everything that we're talking about applies not only to sports, but applies to business and applies to relationships. It All applies to everything. Everything. It's everything amazing. Is the same. All right. So, you know what? You and I have talked a lot over <coughs> the years, and you mentioned your childhood. A lot of people find this hard to believe, but you had asthma. Yep. And you were picked on. You yeah, were bullied quite I had a very bad skin disease as well. Like, there were days when I would make my hand, that like pus would come out. And wow. it was a really thick, a layer of eczema I had on it. I would wear gloves and you see red spots and dirty spots all through them and I had long sleeves, long necks, turtlenecks, you know, because I didn't want people to see it. You know, so needless to say, yeah, you're gonna be picked on a lot. Yeah. Now, thankfully, I was always physically strong. It's, uh, it's my dad's genes, uh, his whole family, they're all athletes and, and, and gymnasts and, and stuff like that. My brother's, uh, my brother's physically stronger than me. He just chose to become a lawyer, but he could have done the same thing. He went into the army as a colonel, uh, colonel, colonel, yeah, how do you colonel. pronounce it? Yeah, yeah. oh, that's a hard word to pronounce for me. Uh, anyway, he started for fun, he started doing boxing and he became the champion right away there. So wow. this guy was insane, but she said, okay. I'm, so we're always blessed with that. I never, they could never beat me, the kids. And sure enough, if we had PE and like dodgeball, they always, they picked me last, but with things like that, where I could, because I could throw a ball through you almost, sure. right? And I was, you better not a bully because I will aim for you. I, you know, I'll go for your head. I'll go as hard as you can. So they, I was always the first guy they picked <laughs> in sports, right. but in anything else, they, stay away from that guy because he's a leper, right. you know, and he loses his fingers and his ears fall off. And you know, all these things that kids say right. really hurt you. Yeah. It, it, I, I rather had a beating, which I never got, but I, I rather had a, would have had a beating. It would have been easier. Than the words, yeah, yeah, because it stays with you. You know, I was talking about it. I, I did this uh, All Sports United it's, an, uh, it's a charity event and they put me up for it and I, I, I do it for the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. If I would win, the money would go to that to help kids who have the same problem as I have. But then, then you realize, you know, what it, what it really did for you. And in an interview I said, there's two guys, I remember it was at a snack bar where we could eat and they said something and it was a stupid thing they said, but it always stuck with me. Until this day, I hope I don't see these guys. I won't beat them up. But I will get a talk and a very intimidating <laughs> dog, I'll tell you that. They're going to be very scared, you know, because I can't let it go. And that's something that has been 40 years ago. It's incredible. It's incredible how it stays with you, you know. And, and kids nowadays, I mean, on the social media, they commit suicide yes. because of it. It's, it's hard. It's, uh, thankfully, it's taking off right now. For what I understand, bullying is actually getting Long less down. and less. Yes, yes absolutely. You know, one of the great things about this generation is they seem to be more tolerant, they seem to be more accepting, and the bullying is down, and I think that is all good. Yep. It's all good. All right, so back to the asthma thing. So you were asthmatic, uh, and I, if I remember correctly, sometimes it would get so bad where you just <coughs> stayed in bed. I need to, like, once every six weeks, I will be for seven or eight days in bed, not able to eat. Very hard to even drink because you know you. <laughs> that's 24/7. Wow. You know, you're, it's really hard. And people always say, you know, how how did you get through this? How did you get through that? And I go, well, because I always knew there's. I oh, this is the line I always used in fighting and everything I did. There's always people who train harder than me. Right. There's always people who have this disease worse than I. You know, and and that and I knew that. I knew that the asthma attack that I had for simply eight days. I knew that there were people who had it 365 days a year who literally had to move to Switzerland to go to the clean air in order to, you know, have a normal life. Right. So I go, wow, I got it eight days every six weeks. I'm blast, right. you know, and all the eczema, well, I had it on my arms and here and my face, 
Well, there's people who have it entirely, and I've seen those people. You know, they have it everywhere, try to live like that. You know, so if you think like that, there's always somebody who has it worse, you know, then you're not so bad. My, my injury, I had four neck surgeries. My hand, I couldn't use it. In the beginning, I, I couldn't lift my phone, couldn't brush my teeth, I couldn't put on a seatbelt with wow. this arm. Is that how bad it was? I used to do 9-1 on pull-ups, you know, and going from that to not able to grab something out of the fridge, that's a very hard thing to do. But then I started realizing, wait a minute, Nick Newell, he's the guy's congenital amputee, mm. right? And he has a half arm and there's a few little fingers here that it makes up. He became a professional fighter. I think he had 14 fights, lost one, became a champion with half an arm. And I go like, dude, you have your hands <laughs> and you're complaining. I see, and, that, that, and then right away I thought, oh, you know, I didn't use the line that I was using when I was young. There's always mm. people who have it worse. Right. And, and you know, when I saw him fight, I go, okay, I got to shut up now. <laughs> I'm having a great life, trust me. Yeah, it's not that bad. Absolutely. You know, um, something, that, uh, something that you brought up, uh, and I've been talking about this this week, and that is, you know, the amount of strength that we get from being humble that humility, right? Now, here you are, you've been in movies, uh, MMA champion, you're <coughs> recognized in the streets, people come to your gym all the time looking for you, they, wanna, they want you for business, they want your autograph, they want a picture. How do you stay humble? How do you not walk around saying, hey, I'm Boz, look at all the stuff that I've done. <laughs> How do you keep yourself grounded? Because I think that's, well, at the moment you do that, that, you, that's, that that's the killer, you know? You, you're never there. I, I, I think once you reach everything in life, I think that's where you pass on, Yeah. you know? So, you know, I, I, I try to not reach everything that I have. You know, just always work. I thought this in fighting as well. I'm never good enough. Yeah. You know, and that will motivate you to keep normal. And, and I always dislike these people. I had a show on TV for nine years about mixed martial arts, a weekly live show called Inside MMA. That's right, on uh, Access. Access TV. That's and, right. uh, and I always say that there's always these guys who did become big and who I didn't know from, from before they started fighting, great guys, and suddenly now they're champion and they're a completely different person. And I always told myself, this goes back years, I would never want to be that guy. Yeah. That is so fake. You know, I mean, and, and how hard it is, because then you see them in the green room, right? This is where the, all the preps are for the people who don't know what the green room is. In the green room, you go in before the interview and you sit there, you know, they give you a little coffee and everything, preparing for the interview, and then you go on stage right. and you do the interview. And they're complete a-holes, they're sitting there, and once the light goes on on TV, they're this, oh, hey, yeah. how you doing? And I go, wow, that's gotta be very hard, you know, to act like that the whole time yeah. just be yourself if you're a douchebag there be a douchebag on tv you know people pay you if you're a douche, pay to see you lose yes you know i mean how many bad guys look at uh, floyd mayweather right yes. a lot of people don't like the guy but they want to see him lose that's why everybody buys the pay-per-view so it works really well and some fighters did it on purpose right. frank shamrock tito ortiz very smart business guys really good guys but on camera, yeah, they come over like a complete a-hole. You know, Conor McGregor right now. Yes. You know, well, you meet the guy. He's the <laughs> nicest person, family man, you know, but he turns it on on TV because he knows people want to either see me win or lose or whatever it is, they will buy a ticket. They'll buy a ticket. That's important. And that's a little bit different when you're doing it like that because that's for the entertainment value yep. versus the, the fake personality where you want people to think that you're a nice guy, but in reality, you're an a-hole like you're talking about. Yep. And that sooner or later, those people are discovered. Uh, you know, sometimes it's much later. And, and of course, I think it comes back to that humility. You know, when you're puffed up like that and you're prideful, then, you know, you, ha you, know, you, you play that game. And then when, when something happens and your life is turned upside down, well, this is saying, right? All, all people in hell are proud. Proud. Yes, I like that. That's a great saying. They're all proud. Yes. It's the number one sin, actually, yeah. pride. Yeah. And from the seven deadly sins, that's the number one. You know, people don't know how it affects you, but if you really start thinking about things that you get angry about, like for traffic, for instance, for me yes. stopping in or people going into traffic, and I go, why are people doing it like this? It's so dangerous. Now you can do it with me because I, can, you know, I have the reaction for it, but if it's an old person, this could be really trouble. But then I started thinking, right? Because if I'm sitting shotgun with somebody and they do it, I'm not angry. Yeah. I go, okay, wait a minute. So I see it as a personal attack. What? When, when you're driving. Yeah. yeah. What, am I better than them? Am I truly believe I'm better than them? And I go, yeah, and you know, driving, I know, because I try to take care of everybody. I always use my turn circle, make sure, you know, somebody be close behind me. You know, I do all that. But you have to simply understand that as people, 
who don't, are not like that. Yeah. They excel in different areas. They blow me away in different areas. Right. You know, the better you there. So, you know, once you start seeing that, then you say, oh, that's actually a pride thing. Yes. You think you're better than them when you're driving. That's a bad thing to have. Get rid of that thing, you yeah. know? See, so it slips in really gentle. It does, it <laughs> yeah. does. You know what, well, when I look back at my life, the biggest mistakes I've ever made were based on pride, right? Because yep. I thought I was somebody or I had achieved a certain level of success and I got, the, I got this house or I got this car or I got whatever and, and it's pride. And it's, what's interesting is when you look at pride, when you study it, all sins are, are what do you call it, in effect from pride. From pride, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it, people who steal are too proud to work or whatever, you know what I'm saying, or, or, you know, or, or uh, this uh, belongs to me. This belongs it's to mine. me. I'm it's just going to get it. It's hey, mine. yeah, uh, this guy's rich and I'm poor, and so I deserve it. Yeah, I'll yeah. take it from him. My arm, you know, this happened, didn't, didn't happen from fighting. It was stupidity on my part from a TV show fight scene in where we had to figure out a way because the lead actor was going to beat me up. And my lead, lead, the lead actor is my, a close friend of mine. He says, it's so, it's not real. I mean, yeah. this boss Ruth and something, I want something to happen that he's dazed and then, and then I got lucky and that's how I knock him out because otherwise he's going to look stupid. And I go, oh, I got it. I, got a, I jump on your back, I forget to put my hooks in, you lean over, and while I'm leaning over, my head is here, I slip off your back and I spike myself upside down on my head, which will make me dizzy, and then you hit me in the throat or something, he goes, yeah, but you, you want to do that? Isn't that not dangerous? <laughs> Come on, man. I can I'm do anything, I'm not sure. I was undefeated, nobody, I never got hurt. Right, right. I shouldn't have done that. That was it. You wow. know, and I didn't even realize it until I saw the episode and I go, oh, that's where it started. That's I just dropped upside down, top of my head, crushed my nerves, nerve stops working, sending signals to my muscles, and that's it. All you get now. all atrophied. And this, if you think this is small, you should have seen my arm, how it looked when it happened. You know, after, when the neck stops working, the nerves, this becomes, it's like taking the spark plug out of a, 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 out of a oh, cylinder. Yeah. It won't work, you know, you need the nerves, they send the signals, not only for pain, but also to make your muscles work, it was a stick. It was a stick. This is actually big compared to what it was. And wow. it's, it's nothing here, see, so. That's incredible, yeah. that's incredible. But again, started from pride. Yeah. I can do this, yeah. I'm not gonna do it. My dad used to say when I was a kid, it's so funny, he said, you're gonna die one day. And you know, it's a stupid death. You think you are invincible. If somebody pulls a gun, you're literally gonna say, oh shoot, I'll, I'll bounce <laughs> off. You actually think that it will bounce off. That's how stupid you are right now. <laughs> you think you're invincible. You're not invincible. And he was right. Yeah, 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 <laughs> Thankfully, yeah. nobody ever pulled a gun. <laughs> yeah, that would have been bad. Uh, oh, right. well, go shoot. Yeah, yeah, that's right. That's right. But you know what? That's also part, again, part of pride, part of being young. Yeah. Is that you think you're invincible. Hey, I, I, you know, I'm going to live forever or whatever. And yeah, man, sometimes I miss that. It is, it is. I miss that. Uh, you know, what I don't miss is just sometimes the, the way I reacted to people. Yes. And, and, and I do have to say, I've, and it comes from my bullying, right? I'm being bullied, I never mistreated people right. because I know how it felt. Right, right. You know, so I never did that. But if I see an a-hole on the street beating somebody else up or hitting a woman, he's going down. It's, yeah. You know, because that's my job now. That's what I thought always. Right. You know, and then sometimes you do things that later on, like many years later, you go like, Oof, yeah, that was a little hard what I did there. He deserved it, that's true. <laughs> but, you know, I, I took it to the next level, you know. <laughs> I, I didn't need that. And most of the time, and, and especially with bullies, it's the only language they speak. Yes. You know, you can't hit him, you can't. No, you have to hit these guys. You they hit you, something. bam, knock him out. That's how it feels. You like that? Don't do it anymore. My first, my first bully, Shaki was his name, always after me until I started doing Taekwondo, started getting stronger and then the whole group came by again on their bicycles and they're shouting again, hey leper, watch out, your ears don't fall. And this time I shouted something back, I heard them laugh, I looked back and they're making a 180, they start following me, I put my car, my, my, car, my, my bike, bicycle on the pavement, put on the stand, I got this is it, I'm gonna, I'm gonna face it now. That was literally, I can get goosebumps now from it because it stayed with me for such a long time. This surrounded me, Chucky came, started, boom, one shot, out, like completely knocked out. Everybody oh. freaked out, noses broke, so we get to the police. Right. So the police showed up at my mom and dad's house and that was it for me, no more martial arts, of course. But I tell you, 95% of the bullying stopped right there. Sure. Everybody was afraid. So sometimes you need to do it. It's the only language these dumbasses, because they don't have the IQ, 
It's proven right. that bullies have a lower IQ. Yeah, there could be exceptions, but the, the, the majority, majority right. does happen because if you really think about it, who in the right state of mind bullies a weaker kid and does it with a group of guys? Right. Why don't they go after the big jock? Right, the, the, the 200 pound guy in, in high school. Go after him if you're such type. Then they don't do that. They pick the weak kids right. or who they think they are weak. You know? And then they do it on top of that with the group. So that says something about the personality of a bully. That's right, that's right. And, and you know what? And it's a, a low self-esteem kind of an issue, right? Yep. Because they need the <coughs> validation from the group to say, oh, look, you're, you are powerful. Oh, you're yeah. so good. <laughs> Let, okay, let's, so let's talk about faith. Uh, how important is your faith to you uh, as far as you know business uh, a, uh, family uh, acting all through your life talk about your faith because you mentioned that you and I've had uh, experience we went out to, to lunch not too long ago and that came up <coughs> so talk about that um, you know in, in 2013 I've always been a Catholic but I never a practicing Catholic okay. because my parents kind of steered away from it it was at the time when uh, the, the scientists said, no, it was one cell that started everything, and, and they believed it. Right. You know? And I go, that, that to me is a complete dumbest thing that I've ever heard. If you think, okay, so how did, it, how did an eyeball start? What, when did the eyeball start <laughs> in the body? When did it come? First or not? A totally blind organism suddenly starts evolving into an organism that can see. Right. There's two of them. Now it goes to a body. How, how exactly would they go? It makes absolutely no sense to me. And, and for me, it was always... I thought, I was really weird when I was thinking, I thought we were put on this planet by us from the future. Okay. You know, I truly believe in time travel and, and that will happen in the future, things like that, or especially with space where you can bend everything and with wormholes, what they say. You can. So I, that was always my thought. I knew there was something because I had some crazy experience. I had a whole run in, I will tell you, uh, it, with a ghost who really went after me in my old house uh, a bunch of times that I eventually challenged at three o'clock at night because that's the moment the devil is the most active and, right, and that's right. when it stopped. But I mean, the things I've saw, the things my family saw, like literally there's a person in the house, you know, and I, I act like I walk this way and suddenly I run this way and we had a carpet hanging in front of another carpet, a curtain hanging in front of, instead of a door and the, the curtain flew up against the ceiling. Every, my, my old kids, everybody saw because I told them, I said, someone's in the house, stay here. And I act like I'm going right, I shoot left, and boof, the curtain flies up, so I make a beeline, and I go the other way, and there's nobody no. in the house. And everything was closed, and that, that, that ghost also attacked me at night in, the, in my sleep, who pressed me into the bed. It was, the, it was a really wild experience. My kids saw her, it was a woman. You know, I saw her walking by, thinking it was my wife. When I went back to work, my wife was in bed. I go out, you know, with gun, you know, because there's nobody in the house, there's nobody in the house. You know, so that happened also. And then I got into a conference with somebody who talked uh, about how the world started. Uh, I was just sitting in, a friend of mine is a devout Catholic, he said, hey, why don't you sit in, man? We're outside, the jacuzzi, the cabana, you know, you can smoke a cigar and just listen to the guy, see what you think. And he started telling it, and he, the, the story that he says, the leaf fell from the tree. Now that, that the leaf, that's his end destination now, right? So now let's backtrack it. How get it on the tree? And go back, go back, go back, go back. And there was this instant one time, and that's why this tree thing so, so, so got in my head. Right. I was looking, I was 10 years old, and I was looking outside at a tree. And the teacher was apparently talking to me, which I didn't know, and then screamed. And I go, what? And he goes, where are you? What are you doing? I said, I'm looking at that tree. And he says, what about that tree? I said, where did it come from? Well, they planted it there. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. Where does the tree come from? Right. If you back paddle it, where does it come from? And that's what this guy did. He started backpedaling. So, and then you realize there has to be an, a beginning and, and there's got to be an end. Normal, uh, and, and the way he did that and the examples he used, he's a very smart theologian, uh, uh, theologian, right? Theologian. 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 Okay, yeah. good. That was good. And, uh, and it really hit me. And then there was a, a father, Father Ribberger. He's a world-renowned exorcist and he was there as well. And so, of course, I want to hear from him. Sure. And then you hear stories, you go, okay, is that real? Like, I asked him the face shift, ship, shifting of the face, right? right like right. animal-like face. And he goes, like, yeah, that's 90% of the time. That's all happens. And I go, whoa, 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 whoa. All the time? Yeah, that happens 90% of the time. I said, what is the crazy thing? He says, well, we heard a woman one time spoke a language and we couldn't even understand it, recorded it, sent it to the Vatican. It was like Amoraic or something, like a message, a, a language that hadn't been spoken for 1,500 years. You know, it's not, it's not like she can get a Rosetta Stone and start learning the language and act right. like she's a freaking ghost. You see what I mean? So you start hearing those things and then crazy things, people floating. Right. And you know, once you find out that there's that evil, 
and they can beat it with good, you know there's good as well. Right. So that was, it was an easy transition for me to make that aliens us from the future put us on the planet or it was God, God that put us on the planet. And if you backtrack and you really think about it, you know, it had to start somewhere. And people, it, it's one cell, they actually they, now it's 128 cells or something, right? They already right. say, no, no, actually it started with 128. How do you know, dude? <laughs> You're talking about four billion years ago. Yeah, but over four billion years. And then they told me this example. I use this now in talks that I do. Sometimes I talk to uh, uh, parishes. And, um, and I made it, I made it the, the Leo. Leo Severino is the smart guy. Okay. And he made the example with a mousetrap. It needs five components in order to win. You take uh, to work. If you take one opponent, component out, it won't work, right? right, right. So it's uh, irreducible complexity. So you, you, it, it's done. So I figured, I go, man, he got the five thing. I got to come up something with this less. I go, I called him, I go, dude, I got you beat. This is what, I say, a close pin. Oh! A close pin, three, three things. One but, uh, misses, it's not working. So imagine, we're going to Mars, just saying, and for somehow we don't know what a close pin is, right? So right. just for the sake of the argument. So we're walking on Mars, these, these astronauts, and suddenly they find a close pin in the, in, in, on the ground. And they pick it up and they go, oh, that's a good, hey, look, I can actually squeeze something in between it. That's a weird thing. Would they think, that you know, over those four billions of years, it started blowing, and two it, it, it precisely symmetrical pieces of wood <laughs> with all the things here magically just landed next to each other, and then a coil came, or a, 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 a piece of yeah. iron, and it got coiled somehow, and it got in between there, you know, because the four billions, a lot of years, it can happen, right? Right, right. No, everybody with the same mind is going to say somebody put that there. Somebody that's intelligent design. Right. Right. So that is. Three compartments. Now look at your eyes. 10,000 parts are known per eye in order to make it work. There's actually two million parts in the eye, but 10,000. One of them misses, your eye is not functioning like it should be. There's no debt, there's no color, whatever it is. Right. So that, 10,000. Three parts, you said that was a design. But the eye is not a design. And we're not even talking about uh, DNA. You know, Anthony Flew, who was the biggest scientist, uh, uh, what is it, atheist, right? Okay. He actually turned, and I, I talked to the, uh, to the guy who turned him, Roy Varghese. Uh, he, he wrote a book, There Is No God. And he got into a talk with the other theologian, and he was talking about DNA, and that's what ripped him. He made his next book, was the same cover, There Is, and then the, the uh, No, it's crossed out, and it said, There Is a God. So this guy was the biggest atheist there ever been, and suddenly he talks and they start talking about the DNA of people and he realized, yeah, somebody had to design it. Einstein said, this looks way too much like a design. Right. You right. know, so once you break it down, to me, there is no other way. If people truly believe that this is it on life and that we're here for no reason, I don't believe that. I yeah. refuse to believe it because then you... you it's worthless. It's worthless. Your whole life is worthless. <laughs> I mean, all of the stuff that we've learned. Yeah, but pushing yeah. things around. That's yeah. what we're doing. Yeah, exactly. And then we die. And then we, yeah, absolutely. It, it makes no sense. I'm reminded of something that uh, Einstein said, and that is either everything's a miracle or nothing is. And, yep. and this guy's a scientist. This guy really knew what he was talking about. Yep. And so I like to live like everything's a miracle. You know, you and I meeting, you know, is a miracle. Uh, you know, you and your wife, miracle. A miracle, yeah. Uh, every customer that walks in your business is a miracle, right? Uh, people who listen, who are going to listen to this, that's a miracle. I mean, back in the day, we would need to be part of a, of a big broadcasting company, but to, with today's technology, you and I and an iPhone. That's we, it. We, we're, yeah, we're up and running. That's a miracle. I mean, there's just so much good stuff happening. And I like what you said about you have all this evil, and if we have all this evil, we have to have all that good because There's that's totally opposite. true. Yeah, opposite and everything. Yeah, no, it always works. It's, uh, I, I had a, a person say to me, so you really think that God can then come into you and he can change you? <laughs> no, how, how is he gonna do that? I go, how do you update your phone? And he looks at me, I said, what do you do? You have a guy come in who opens the phone up and he gets in there or you just hit update and hey, what, that's weird, wirelessly it gets updated. 
And he looks at me like an idiot. I say, so you don't believe that the person who actually invented this phone is God? <laughs> you know, he can't do that. That's what you're thinking. Yeah. Let's be honest here. You know, I refuse to believe it just for the fact that I had to run in with the ghost and I had all these things and I've seen it. And I understand that people, and I felt it, and I understand that people don't, didn't have that experience and seeing is believing is what they say. Well, then I say, look at the phone. Look at the things that we have, what goes through the air. I mean, there's so much more out there that we know. How many times, and every person has this, that you, uh, me from, I'm away from Holland for 20 years, and sometimes I think about a friend, yeah. sent it that day, and that same day the person emails me. Had, haven't heard from him for 20 years, yeah. but suddenly, and everybody has that. Yeah, they it's call, weird. there's an email, or all of a sudden, boom, I was just thinking about oh, it. Yeah. This is the craziest thing. There is a connection. Yeah. In the early days, all the way back, if you hear, listen to these uh, old saints, they could stop people in the air that were falling down. And people go, that's insane, that you believe that it's so stupid. I go, to me it's stupid that you don't believe that. You know, we are now polluted by everything, by the yeah. phones, but we don't have time for it anymore. That's why I put the stupid phone, phone away. I do this many, the whole, uh, my whole morning, I, I probably put it on around 9.30, but I'm up at six. Right. So I'm working three and a half hours. I do all my things that start my day, and then I turn on my social media, because I know that if I listen to one message, I'm sucked in, yeah. and I'm going to go in there. And then what is it wrong with? Everybody needs to right away and so is a text, we're eating, leave the phone. I know, but then he thinks, I say, I don't care what he thinks. Yeah. You tell him later, I was eating, sorry. My dad told me I couldn't do it. Yeah, but uh, I go, are you serious now? <laughs> leave the thing. That's why I love to go on a cruise yeah. with the family. There's no phone reception oh, whatsoever. Yeah. And you're free, you're sitting at the table. Nobody has time anymore. And uh, a kid does something nice on TV for, an, uh, for a homeless person. And he says, oh, he's such a nice guy. And he gathers, gathers, uh, gathers 150,000 dollars and he helps a whole bunch of and everybody who looks they all say oh man I should do that one time so I should and it's all good to go ping there's the message and boop yeah. the idea's gone and yeah. the Facebook they're sucked in again they don't do it well you know what and, and, and I think it's a little bit more insidious than that <coughs> because this to me is a great way to distract people from the important stuff yep I mean you and I growing up is the devil's invention. Yes. That's what I say. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it really you know, it, it's certainly being used by the devil very yep. well. So, because when you and I were growing up, the only thing that could distract us might be TV. Yep. But for the most time, we were outside doing something. Yep. Nowadays, it's the reverse. Nowadays, people are inside, they're on their phones all the time, and seldom do they go outside. But they're so distracted by this noise coming out of these machines yep. that they don't have time to hear something important. Well, even worse, you know, all the porn, all the stuff, all oh the bad God. stuff that's on it, it becomes normal almost. Yes. Like there is, okay, you see a girl, think about your daughter, dude. Yeah. What would you think? And now this is the worst. Like last week or two weeks ago, this guy, I saw, we, we, I do the podcast as well, right? We're Ruth and Renato podcast. And we come up with these crazy stories. And while I'm going through these stories, there's a guy who find out his daughter was a porn star and everything. And he said, oh no, she looks great on camera. She made a great career choice. Yep, dad of the oh. year, dude, dad of the century. That guy is insane. They, he needs a beating, a guy like that. Yeah. It's unbelievable, but it becomes normal. That's what I'm saying. It's, it's so out of control that the whole world is simply going down the drain. Right, right. Uh, somewhere in the scriptures, it talks about that things will get so bad that good will be called wicked and wicked will be called good. Yeah. And we see that. We see, we see that. it now already. Yeah, yeah, it's happening. Absolutely. We see where, where people are standing up for good family morals and they just get attacked from everywhere and anyway. So, all right. So, I just wanted to bring that up because I think it's important. We just don't get enough of these messages out there. And, and so I'm glad that we were able to talk about this. I want to come over here and talk about Boz, your latest invention, the body action system. Yes. Let's talk about this because I, I know we're getting tight on time. So I wanted to bring this about and I wanted you to tell me what was going on that made you think about this. Well, it, it started that uh, somebody called me. Uh, I, I was represented by William Morris and, um, and this woman, uh, Patty Brenner, she's, uh, she did the Ionic Breeze, the Razor Scooter. She did these big things, you know. And uh, they came up with a stand, but the stand was only these two things. Mm. That's how it started. And it was funny because I walked in with a hangover. Her, Dutch, her husband is Dutch. And, um, 
And they were laughing already. I said, listen, I walked in, I said, you're going to smell, I'm, I, I'm a super hangover, just show me the product. I'll come back to you tomorrow and I'll let you know what I think about it. I said, but don't worry, I know exactly what I'm seeing. So I see the two things and I go, okay, okay, let me see. I think we can make it better. I said, but let me, uh, let me think about it. I'll give you a call tomorrow. So the next day at 10 o'clock in the morning, I give her a call. I said, okay, this is what I think. And I give her the whole list. And she goes, wow, you, you were really paying attention. I said, yeah, but we can make it better. We can make it ahead. You know, I love it with the spring, but uh, yeah. make, make, make it ahead. Yeah, right now, it's, we took this bag off. So it's, it's a little m moving right now, you see, because I, there's yeah. nothing, it's holding it down. The great thing about it is that you can hit it just like a real hat. Anything a back, you can't hit, be, uh, uppercuts. Right. You, you know, there's certain things you cannot do on a back. We got targets. You know, if you hit this in the angle that it's shaped in, that's the perfect body shot. And this one too. And this is the solar plexus. Then you can do all the uppercuts and the hooks. So I thought, man, why don't we do that? We used still those two stats for people who want to kick a lot. They can jump to the side and kick those things. You know, you can kick the head as well. That's what I do. But uh, a lot of people don't want to take the risk. But that was it, that's how it came along. And it took a long time to make. Uh, I mean, we were over two and a half years busy with the wow. prototype because I would break them all. And I said, well, listen, if you're gonna use my name on it, body action system, <laughs> it needs to be unbreakable, right? <laughs> right, right. I think we replaced about six of them and we sold a lot. Wow. So uh, we had, w and the, the first two that we replaced was literally was a bad shipment. We got rid of the whole shipment because it was a mistake they made in the factory. And after that, we pretty much never had it anymore. If you hit it like it's supposed to, it's not going to break, you know? But there's guys who, for instance, hit it here at the back, the spring, right. you know? Right. And then, of course, you, you, you're going to break it. It's, right. a, it's normal because it's not designed for that. It's the, this you can kick, this you can knee, you can do everything. But don't start kicking because, you know, you're hitting something else. That's what we say. But it's a great product right now. It's unbreakable. I love it. I love it. And, and of course, I, I, I love the fact that your name is on it. it yeah. Was that by accident? No, no, that's Patty. Patty came up with that. She it's, says, we call it the boss. I go, ooh, it's just my name. She says, no, no, body action system. I go, wow, that's a nice one. <laughs> I yeah, love it. That I was love good. it. That was very smart. <laughs> that was very good. And her name is? Patty Brenner. Patty Brenner. Yeah. Good job, Patty Brenner. I love it. I love it. Well, great, man. You know what? I've enjoyed our time together, and I wanted to wrap this up and... and uh, just say thank you so much. It's been delightful getting to know you and uh, in, in, in talking about business, talking about faith, talking about family, uh, about your story. And it's been incredible. I appreciate your time so much. You're very welcome, man. Thank you very much. Yeah. Absolutely, man. to relive good. my life. It's a good thing. <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, man.